Hello student, today we are going to learn about the regional anatomy of the upper limb in which shoulder is our main topic. We will start from the shoulder. So let's begin with our outlines. These are the points of dissection from the anterior and the posterior limb. Let's talk about the shoulder. Shoulder is a region of upper limb attached to the trunk. The bony framework here we go to clavicle, scapula, which form the pe pectoral girdle, these two bones together, also known as shoulder girdle, and the proximal end of the humerus is also taking part in it. And superficial muscles in the shoulders are coming something like the toid, trapezius, and this is anterior view, this is the posterior view. So first of all we will go to the bones. Let's talk about the collarbone which is named as the clavicle. It's the only bony attachment between the trunk and the upper limb. It is small web, has a gentle S shape as we can see here. It is having two ends. The acromium end is flat which is literally and the sternal end is a quarter angular in shape which is middle end let's see in a tube here here we are looking for the dim side the inferior view we got here on the letter side the conoid tubercle and trapezoid line which are the actually point for the attachment of the ligaments Let's talk about the second bone, that is the scapula. Scapula is a large flat triangular bone with the three angles. Angles named represented in the short I mentioned in the bracket. Superior, inferior, and lateral. Three borders, superior, medial, and the lateral. In the little is a little bit thick border, medial is thin border, and superior border is also thin. It goes to two surfaces, anterior and the posterior surface. It goes to three processes. We got here a chromium process. We got here a finger like projection that is actually a crocoid process. If we look from the posterior view, then we will find the long spine. That is a third process. This is a little view. You can see very clearly. And this blue portion here is representing the glenoid fossa, which is actually covered with the articular cartilage to make the joint with the head of the humerus. Something more about the bone marking on the scapula. Here we go. To, is it talking about at the lateral angle? We go to here the tubercle, supraglenoid, and the infraglenoid tubercle, respectively, above and below the glenoid cavity. We go to here the spine, as posterior view. I show you the spine here. Here, this was the spine. So at this place above the spine and below the spine, this region we give the name as a supraspinous fossa and the infraspinous fossa respectively. And when the scapular spine is finishing at this place, they are communicating with each other. And when it detached from this part, the same extension will change the name as the acromion process, which one is moving forward and making the joint with the clavicle. We got here greater scapular notch. This green arrow place is actually the greater scapular notch, also known as the spinoglenoid notch. Anteriorly, we got 
the anterior subscapular fossa which is actually tracking toward the ribs that's also known as the costal surface and the lateral and the middle borders I have mentioned already we go to the crocoid finger like projection here and on the superior border we are having a notch, a small notch we call that suprascapular notch when the ligament will attach over there, transfer scapula then this notch will change into the foramenia okay so let's see about the proximal part of the humerus in the proximal part the head anatomical neck we go third to tubercles here the lesser and the greater tubercle which are actually for the attachment of the uh, rotator cuff muscles we got the three lines here these three lines are representing the attachment of the muscles respectively from the lateral to the middle side we can come lateral lip is representing the attachment of the pectoris major intertubercular circus this place for the latissimus tersi and the middle one is for the teres major muscle the v shape here is the tuberosity we give the name as a deltoid tuberosity is giving the attachment to the deltoid muscle and here the thin vertical of line is for the cracobrachialis muscle Little view for delta tuberosity. See here in the posterior view on the lesser tubercle from the anterior view and the greater tubercle very clearly from the posterior view. So the lesser tubercle we are having the attachment of the subscapularis muscle and greater tubercle three small facets for the attachment of respectively supraspinatus, infraspinatus and the teres minor muscle and these four muscles are known as rotator cuff muscles here are the three muscles attachment on the three lines of a line lateral to medial later one is cut here pectoris major then latissimus torsi then teres major Let's talk about the joints. There are three joints in the shoulder complex. Their name as sternoclavicular, acromioclavicular, and gluteohumeral joint. So first picture here in front of us that is a sternoclavicular joint between the manibrum part of the sternum and the middle end of the clavicle. The second joint on the lateral end of the clavicle and a chromium process of the scapula this part here this joint a chromo clavicular joint the third joint that is present between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus so that joint together we give the name as a glenohumeral joint glenohumeral joint is a main joint of the shoulder for the movement let's talk about is a synovial ball and socket joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scapula multi-axial with a wide range of movement the joint stability is by the ligaments and also supported by the rotator cuff muscles and it is providing the wide range of movement as the shallow glenoid cavity and the round head of the humerus is providing the great mobility at this place and the articulations are covered with the hyaline cartilage except for the labrum of the glenoid cavity is formed by the fibrocartilage
the fibrous membrane of the joint capsule is thickened anteriorly in the three locations to form the superior, middle, and the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. The same name as the joint glenohumeral ligament. The ligament that is coming from the coracoid process to the humerus, we call that coracohumeral ligament. Coracohumeral ligament. After that, we got here the ligament that is scaring the long tendon of the bicep muscle here. That is a transfer humeral ligament. Joint stability is provided by the surrounding muscles, tendons, and a skeleton arch formed superiorly by the coracoid process and the chromium and the coracoacromial ligament at this place, a ligament present, we call that coracoacromial ligament. Let's see that in this picture we can see the coracoacromial ligament. Okay, when we see the shoulder joint from the little view, so it looks something like this, the glenoid cavity, let's begin from here, which one is covered with the hyaline cartilage, and this ring is by the fibrocartilage and around this portion here we got the synovial membrane inside this cavity here at the supraglenoid tubercle we are having the cut tendon of the long head of bicep outside this synovial membrane we are having the fibrous membrane outside the fibrous membrane these green sacs which are also cut, they are the bussas. What structures they are present in between? We give the name just like subdeltoid bursa, subtendinous bursa of the muscles. Now let's talk about these muscles, those you are surrounding. So first of all, we would like to talk about the rotator cuff muscles. Rotator cuff muscles, the anteriorly, this part, this muscle is coming from the anterior portion that is a subscapularis muscle superiorly above the spine this is the supraspinatus muscle posteriorly this part inferior to spine here infraspinatus muscle and below this here this small one that is a teres minor and lower to the teres minor here we go to teres major okay and the infraglenoid tubercle at this place this is the long head of the tricep brachy muscle this muscle here that is a latissimus dorsi and the muscle here that going to attach on the crocoid two possibilities short head of the bicep and the coracobrachius muscle both are attaching here and here this big muscle that is a pectoris major muscle okay let's talk about the blood supply and innervation of the glenohumeral joint this is the posterior view of the glenohumeral joint so vascular supply to the glenohumeral joint is mainly from the anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery those are making the circumflex around it and some part is also from the suprascapular arteries above the scapulas. if we talk about the innovation so the branch is coming from the posterior cord of the brachial plexus mainly from the suprascapular axillary lateral pectoral nerves branches are innovating the glenohumeral joint Muscles we are going to talk about two most superficial muscles of the shoulder are trapezius and the deltoid muscle Okay, so here we can see from the posterior view trapezius very clearly Okay So deep to the trapezius we got here levator scapula Rhomboid minor rhomboid major And let this muscle so I'll just talk about Now let's talk about the posterior scapular region. 
It is located deep to the trapezius and deltoid muscle. As we can see that deltoid and trapezius muscles vanish from here. Under the deltoid and trapezius muscles we can see here the four muscles and these four muscles are coming like that way. The Above the spine we give the name as the supraspinatus, below the spine the infraspinatus and here we go the teres minor and then the teres major. So in between the teres minor and major we are having here the long hand of the tricep is moving from there. The suprascapular foramen, suprascapular foramen at this place, uh, the suprascapular nerve passes through the suprascapular foramen, the suprascapular artery, suprascapular vein follow the same course as a nerve, but normally it passes immediately superior to the superior transverse scapular ligament as we can see here, not to the foramen. In this picture you can see here. Let's talk about the quadrangular space. The axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex femoral artery and the vein passes through this space. Quadrangular because it is having the full angle. So the boundary of this quadrangular space is literally we go to the humerus medially we go the long hand of the triceps superiorly teres minor inferiorly teres major so this way that we got here the quadrangular space here so a hypertrophy of the quadrangular space muscles or the fibrosis of the muscles edges may impinge on the axillary nerve so uncommonly this procedure we conserve the deltoid muscles and the trophy of the teres minor muscle As in this picture, we can see the passage for the axillary nerve through the quadrangular space and the posterior circumflex humeral artery in the vein. Triangular space. This triangular space here, we go to superior teres minor, inferior teres major, and then literally we go to the long hand of the triceps. So this small space uh, communicating between the axilla and the posterior scapular region the circumflex scapular artery and the vein passing through this gap. And as you can see here, the artery is only mentioned in this diagram. Triangular travel. It goes the three boundaries. The medially we go the long head of the tricep, laterally the shaft of the humerus, and superior we go the teres major. So the triangle interval main content is the radial nerve, the profound vertebral artery, which is also known as the deep artery of the arm, and uh, these structures are passing through. So the arteries, if we talk about in the posterior scapular region, so three major arteries: the suprascapular artery, we got here. Posterior circumflex humeral artery, we got here, and the circumflex scapular artery, we got here. Veins in the posterior scapular region generally follow the arteries and connect with vessels in the neck, back, arm, and the axilla. Talking about the clinical correlations now. In this radiograph, you can see the dislocation of the shoulder, the scapula, and the clavicle are in their normal position. A common process and the clavicle are showing the no problem in their junction. But here, when we are looking at the glenoid cavity, glenoid cavity here at this place, we should have the head of the humerus, but it is not in this place, so we can see the head here. So that is the dislocation of the shoulder very obviously you can observe from the radiograph next we got here the subluxation posterior voluntarily it means that this radiograph is showing that the dislocation happened posteriorly which is not very common actually the inferior 
anterior dislocation of the shoulder is very common which one we have just seen in the previous video class but it is voluntarily it means by force this location could happen posteriorly next clinical we are having here the muscle around the shoulder so this is the view in which you can see the head of the humerus in the middle okay we see here the teres minor we hear the muscle as uh, infraspinatus supraspinatus and the cut portion of the clavicle and also the acromion we see here the coracoid process and in this part that we can also see the subscapularis so it means that the four of our rotator cuff muscles have been seen here okay so this part here is representing the simple normal radiograph now the next portion here we can see the acromioclavicular joint dislocation or you can say separation so here at this place that the normal counter of the clavicle but here it is a little bit elevated so let's see that this part in the radiograph so here is the radiograph in which it is representing the dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint so here we go to the clavicle and the coming process of scapula and you see that the distance is more than the normal the next clinical is a tone of supraspinatus tendon in this radiograph we can see here the head of the humerus here and above that portion that we see the torn portion of the supraspinatus tendon at this place next clinical we are having the winging of scapula which is very famous it happens due to the damage of long thoracic nerve which is innovating the serratus anterior muscle which is attached here on the medial border of the scapula and in this condition you can see that the medial end is very prominent in the book in the shoulder region and the posterior scapular region we are having the following clinicals these are clinicals you need to cover up some of them i covered already in the lecture some you need to cover up if you have any problem then you can contact with me thank you very much okay we're going to talk about the original anatomy of upper limb and the topic of today is the axilla axilla is number one transition area of the upper limb so here we go the outlines and let's begin axilla is the gateway to the upper limb providing an area of transition between the neck and the arm as you can see here this green color is representing the axilla it is an irregular shape pyramidal space with the inlet four sided wall and the floor or base we can see here the superior view in which the green space is representing the axilla and this is the actually superiorly we can say an inlet of axilla anteriorly we got here the clavicle posteriorly we go to the scapula and the medially we are having here the first rib another view of the axilla in which anterior wall medial wall posterior wall and the lateral wall is representing have we got another view of axilla and in which it is showing that axillary sheet in which all the axillary content will be embedded axillary inlet axillary inlet is the actually apex which is open of this pyramidal space until we go the clavicle posteriorly the scapula and medially we got here the first rib let's talk about the four walls and the first of all we got here the anterior wall so anterior wall of the axilla we got here in the red color the anterior wall we are having the pectoralis major muscle 
we are having the pectoralis minor muscle we are having a very small muscle under the clavicle we call that subclavius muscle so we got here the pectoralis major muscle making the anterior wall when we cut a pectoralis major muscle under that we can find the subclavius and pectoralis minor muscle so let's see that here after cutting the pectoralis major muscle we can see here the pectoralis minor muscle and a very small muscle here subclavius into the clavicle so these two muscles are embedded in the fascia we call that clavio-pectoral fascia from the little view we can see here the pectoralis major muscle pectoralis minor muscle subclavius muscle and this green boundary here around the muscle is representing here the clavio pectoral fascia and that is a suspensive ligament the posterior wall of axilla here is representing in this diagram as the yellow color and uh, there are four muscles we can see in another view the four muscles are like this subscapularis here teres major latis mastorsi and the long head of the tricep they are making the posterior wall of the axilla here we got the subscapularis teres major latis mastorsi long head of tricep is not mentioned in this diagram let's talk about the middle wall so middle wall if we look on this diagram is represented as the green color in which one muscle is involved we call that serratus anterior muscle some writer also consider the intercostal spaces and the muscles in it very good serratus anterior muscle so upper part of the serratus anterior making the middle wall let's talk about the little wall little wall in this diagram is representing as the blue color is representing the intertubercular sucus on the proximal part of the humerus. Here we got intertubercular sucus between the two tubercles. Talking about the content of the axilla is very important. We got here the axillary artery, axillary vein, and the brachial plexus, axillary lymph nodes. They are all embedded in the axillary sheet and here we go the loss we get here the axillary process from the breast except that some writer also consider the proximal part of the bicep and the crocobagellus muscle as a content of axilla here we go the summary of the axilla in which we can see here the inlet and the downside here we go the floor and we go the anterior and the posterior wall we go the medial and the lateral wall with its content. Thank you very much. As today we can learn the brachial plexus in the five minutes or maybe less time. Uh, what you need to do, prepare the pencil or pen and not what to draw together with me. The brachial plexus contain the neural connection between the neck and brachial nerves. The speedy method helps simplify understanding the diagram of the brachial plexus so draw the two headless arrows to the right next you need to draw another headless arrow to the left but a little bit shorter as compared to the previous drawn two in the middle come previously Then you need to add the W. Add an X. Add one slopey slash, you can say, or Y, to making just a branch. Then on the left side, you can write down C5, C6, C7, C8 and the T1 as we know that the brachial plexus is actually formed by the roots of this starting from the C5 to the ending at the T1 and on the another hand you can mark down 
musculocutaneous as MC, median as M, and the ulnar as U, and the middle arrow here you can mark down as the R, as the radial, and uh, AX as the auxiliary nerve. So in this diagram, we are having the main branches from the root to the main branches. And these are the five main branches of the brachial plexus. Need to remember them, must need to remember them. Okay. So to going on to the more complex, we need to include the three S. It means that we are going to include the three on each error okay so neurosurgeon neurologist psychiatrist anatomist all, all use this system diagram so let's see that the first three we are going to put here by joining the c5 c6 and the c7 when you join them together as a result you got the nerve we call as the long thoracic nerve in the previously i have talked about in the posterior scapular region the long thoracic nerve is innervating the serratus anterior muscle and the damaging of this nerve is leading us to the clinical what we call that ringing of scapula next we got here the another three here and on the upper arrow so label them as DSN that is representing dorsal scapular nerve and here the SS representing the suprascapular nerve LP is representing as the lateral pectoral nerve next another three we need to add up here so let's label them as SS as a subscapular you need to remember to differentiate these SS are different above one supra below one is subscapular okay so proximal and the distal subscapular and uh, also you can say medial and the lateral or upper and the lower so in the middle that this one is the thoraco dorsal nerve okay so the final three we put here in the bottom and let's label them as the MP medial pectoral nerve upper we got the lateral pectoral like medial pectoral and then these two are actually the cutaneous so we medial brachial cutaneous and medial antibrachial cutaneous nerve okay and need to remember that brachial is going to the arm and the antibrachial is going to the forearm and forearm I'm surely that going distally now let's divide it and label it as the root, trunks, divisions, cords, and the terminal branches. So root. How many roots have we got? One, two, three, four, five. So how many roots the bracket plexus is having? Five. From C5 to T1. Next question, the trunks. How many trunks it got? Three. Upper, middle, lower. Each trunk is going to divide into two branches anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior, anterior, posterior. Next we got here how many cords? Three cords. Lateral, medial, and the posterior cord. Now what happened here? Very, very interesting. All the trunks their posterior division is going to join together and making the posterior cord. The upper and the middle trunk anterior division both join together and make the lateral cord. And the lower trunk anterior division alone or you can say the continuity of the anterior division of the lower trunk is going to make the middle cord. And then the terminal branches, let us talk about. Lateral and the medial core join together. And as a result, giving the median nerve. And 
upper portion muscular cutaneous lower is the ulna the continuation of the posterior cord terminating as the axillary and continuing as the radial nerve one thing we are still missing in this picture let's see yeah a small branch here this small branch is going to a very small muscle under the clavicle we call that subclavius muscle so the nerve to the subclavius muscle so that's the bracket plexus if you have any question then you can contact with me thank you okay, we're going to talk about the muscles of shoulder and uh, this classification is uh, mentioned in the grace book we're following the grace book so different writers the classification is different so please follow our textbook grace so you will not get confused about the classification of the muscles in muscles of shoulder we go the five muscles first of all we go the trapezius second deltoid third levator scapulae fourth rhomboid minor and the fifth rhomboid major so let trapezius is a large muscle and uh, left side is mentioned here and the right side here is uh, dissected so let's talk about the origin of the trapezius muscle is originating from the superior neutral line is present here you can see that superior inferior neutral line on the back of the occipital bone so it is originating from the superior neutral line external occipital protuberance and the middle margin of the ligamentum nuchae spinous process of C7 to the T12 and the related supraspinous ligament so that we got here the origin of the trapezius muscle now let's talk about the insertion is inserting on the superior edge of the crest of the spine of the scapula at this place a chromium and the posterior border of the lateral one-third of the clavicle that we can't see from the posterior view so we need to go to the lateral view as we can see on the lateral view that the lateral one-third of the clavicle is having the insertion of the trapezius muscle is innovating uh, motor branch of the accessory nerve and the sensory from the anterior MI of the C3 to C4 function is a powerful elevator of the scapula rotate the scapula during the abduction of the humerus above the horizontal middle fiber retract the scapula lower fiber depress the scapula Uh, talking about the deltoid muscle second in our list so deltoid muscle here is mentioned in the yellow color so deltoid muscle uh, origin we are seeing here is from the inferior edge of the crest of the spine of scapula as we can see here a little margin of the acromion and the anterior border of the lateral one-third of the clavicle that we can see from the posterior view let's go to the later view as we can see that deltoid from the lateral one-third of the clavicle having the origin is inserting on the deltoid tuberosity on the humerus his innovation is from the axillary nerve mainly from the C5 and uh, the function it is a major abductor of the arm abduct beyond the initial 15 degree done by the supra spinatus muscle and after that done by the deltoid clavicular fiber assist in flexing the arm posterior fiber assisting in extending the arm levator scapulae muscle from the name is representing it is helping to elevate the scapula Talking about its origin, is originating from the transverse processes of the C1 and the C2 vertebrae and the posterior tubercle 
of the transfer processes of C3 and the C4 vertebrae. It is inserting on the posterior surface of the middle border of the scapula from the superior angle to the root of the spine of the scapula. Its innovation is from the C3, C4 nerve of anterior mac and also from the dorsal scapular nerve and the function elevates the scapula. Rhomboid minor muscle number four in our list. This muscle is rhomboid shape as we can see here and it is smaller as compared to the major which is inferior to this. So rhomboid minor is originating from the lower end of the ligamentum nuchae here and the spinous process of the C7 to the T1 vertebrae is inserting on the posterior surface of the medial border of the scapula at the root of the spine of the scapula innovating by the dorsal scapular nerve and elevates and retract the scapula Rhomboid major muscle uh, number fifth in our list and is originating from the spinous process of the T2 to T5 vertebrae and intervertic supraspinous ligament is inserting at the posterior surface of the middle border of the scapula from the root of the spine to the inferior angle of the scapula is also innovated from the dorsal scapular nerve, elevates and retract the scapula. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about rotator cuff muscles, and let's begin. And there are four rotator cuff muscles around our shoulder, and uh, today we will talk about their origin and insertion, their innovation, and their action on the shoulder. So first of all, we're going to talk about the supraspinatus. It is one of the four. So we can see here, number one is representing the supraspinatus. And uh, its origin is from the supraspinous fossa of the scapula. As it is above the spine, this region, so it is named as the supraspinous fossa. So supraspinatus muscle is originating from here and it is inserting on the greater tubercle of the humerus superiorly here at this part and its main action is the abduction of the arm at the shoulder joint is taking part in it and uh, is innovation by the suprascapular nerve which is coming from the C4 to C6 level let's have a look at how it looks in the region that the supraspinatus muscle Let's have a look from the little view, attaching at the greater tubercle of the humerus, superiorly at this spot. Let's go to the second muscle. The second is the infraspinatus below the spine. Here we can see this region is representing the origin of the infraspinatus muscle. Infraspinatus muscle originating from the infraspinous fossa of the scapula and it is inserting on the same tubercle, greater tubercle, but a little bit below as compared to the supraspinatus here. Its main action when it contracts the external rotation of the arm and is innovated by the suprascapular nerve tube. See on the origin that infraspinatus muscle from the infraspinous fossa and inserting on the greater tubercle. See from the later view here the infraspinous muscle attaching on the greater tubercle. Now we are going to the third muscle of the rotator cuff. The number three is representing the number third muscle that is actually the teres minor is originating from the lateral border of the scapula 
and it is also inserting on the greater tubercle of the humerus as the above two but it is the most inferior as compared to the other two so its main function is the external rotation of the arm and weak adduction a weak adduction when it contract it is performing a little bit uh, adduction too so it's uh, innovation is happening by the axillary nerve from the c5 to c6 level let's see that in the muscle here we got the teraspinal muscle let's see from the lateral view the last muscle of the rotator cuff subscapularis subscapularis muscle actually we can see behind the rib cage at this place on the scapula at uh, the subscapular fossa of the scapula it is originating and inserting on the lesser tubercle of the humerus and its main function is the internal rotation and it's innovating from the upper and the lower subscapular nerve from the C5 and C6 level so we can see here the subscapularis which is originating from the subscapular fossa and inserting on the lassa tubercle of the humerus let's see from the little view and in the little view you can also see that is inserting on the lassa tubercle so we are done with our four rotator cuff muscles let me repeat one more time supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor subscapularis thank you very much have a nice time okay today we are going to learn about the axillary artery which is the content of uh, axilla axillary artery supplies the wall of axilla and related region and continues as a major blood supply to the more distal part of the upper limb the subclavian artery in the neck becomes the axillary artery at the lateral margin of the rib one and passes through the axilla becoming the brachial artery at the inferior margin of the teres major muscle the axillary artery is separated into the three parts by the pectoral minor muscle which crosses anteriorly to the vessel so we can see here it is starting at the lateral margin of the or lateral border of the first rib and continuing downward to the lower border of the teres major muscle so before it it is the subclavian after this it is the brachial artery so between the subclavian and the brachial we got here axillary artery it is closely related to the cords of the brachial plexus and their branches and it is also enclosed within the axillary sheath with the other structures in the axilla it is crossed anteriorly by the pectoral spinal muscle as we can see here and it is divided into the three parts first part proximal to the pectoral spinal second posterior to this and the third part is distal to the pectoral spinal Let's talk about the first part of the axillary artery. First part is starting from the lateral border of the first rib to the upper border of pectoris minor. And anteriorly, it is related to the pectoris major muscle, which is cut off here, and lateral to the cords of the brachial plexus. First part is having the one branch, and this branch is named as superior thoracic artery it is a small and originating from the anterior surface of the first part of the axillary artery it supplies the upper region of the medial and the anterior axillary wall
Let's talk about the second part of the axillary artery that is behind the pectoris minor muscle. It is related medially, laterally, and posterior to the cross bending cord of the brachial plexus. Second part is having the two branches tracheocromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. So, right at the medial border of the pectoris minor, under that, we are having the branch coming out that is the tracheocromial artery. It is short and is curved around the superior margin. We can also say the superior or the middle margin of the muscle and penetrating into the clavipectoral fascia. And after that, it is dividing, immediately dividing into the small four branches. These small branches named as pectoral, deltoid, clavicular, and the acromial branches. They are supplying the anterior wall of the axilla and related region. Additionally, the pectoral branch is also contributing to give the supply to the breast. From the inferior border, or you can say uh, the lower border, a lateral border of the pectoris minor muscle, right posterior to this is having the branch we call that lateral thoracic artery. So talking about the lateral thoracic artery, it supplies the medial and anterior wall of axilla. In women, branches emerge around the inferior margin of pectoris major muscle and contribute to the vascular supply of the breast too. The third part of the axillary artery. Third part extending from the lower border, lateral border of the pectoris minor muscle to the lower border of the teres major muscle. And is also related to the medial, lateral, and posterior to the branches of the cords of the branchial plexus. It is giving the three branches number one, the subscapularis, number two, anterior circumflex humeral artery, number three, the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So let's talk about the first branch from the third part of the axillary artery that is a subscapular. Subscapular actually it is the largest branch of the axillary artery and uh, it is the major blood supply which is supplying to the posterior wall of axilla. It also contributes to the blood supply to the posterior scapular region divided into two terminal branches. Those terminal branches are the circumflex scapular artery and thracodorsal artery. The circumflex scapular artery passes through the triangular space contributing to an anatomous network of vessels around the scapula at the backside. The second branch is the thracodorsal artery of the subscapular that is following the lateral border of the scapula to the inferior angle and contribute to the vascular supply to the posterior and the middle wall of the axilla. Let's talk about the anterior circumflex humeral artery. Anterior circumflex humeral artery is originating from the lateral side of the axillary artery and it is a small as compared to the posterior circumflex humeral artery and uh, it passes anterior to the surgical neck of the humerus and anatomosis with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. The anterior circumflex humeral artery supplies to the surrounding tissue which include the glenohumeral joint and the head of the humerus. Let's talk about the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Posterior circumflex humeral artery originates from the lateral surface of the third part of the axillary artery immediately posterior to the origin of the anterior circumflex humeral artery. With the axillary nerve it is leaving the axilla by passing through the quadrangular space. 
we have a complete lecture on the shoulder and we have explained about the quadrangular space and the content passing through that. The posterior circumflexium artery curve around the surgical neck of the humerus and supply the surrounding muscles and also the glenohumeral joint. It enasmosis with the anterior circumflexium artery and with branches from the profundi branchi, suprascapular and the thoracochromial arteries. Here we go the summary of the axillary artery. It's starting and ending point and it's three parts and each part is having the branches. It is very interesting information. The first part is having the one branch, second part is having the two branches, third part is having the three branches. Here we go to one picture labeled already from the book representing the origin and the termination of this artery is three parts. Thank you very much.